Uh, good morning and welcome to the University of KwaZulu Natal. Is there? Is it fine? Okay. I would like to thank each and every one of you who are present this morning, and I'm Cheryl Porthitter, and I would especially like to acknowledge the new Vice Chancellor of UKZN, uh, Dr. Albert van Jarsveld. If you don't know who he is, he's sitting right at the front table. Uh, thank you, Albert, for being here in a very busy week. And we would also like to acknowledge Dr. Pumla Manganga. And you notice that I've said doctor. She's our current chair of council, and she is a doctor. She received a PhD from FITS in December. So welcome, Pumla. And I would also like to acknowledge fellow members of the executive, deans, management from the city, colleagues from our sister institutions, DUT and U University of Zululand, staff, students of UKZN, alumni, and of course we acknowledge and thank the panelists. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Professor Fakili Mazubuko, who used to be here and has left and has come back to us as a professor emeritus and is one of the panelists. So welcome, Professor Mazabuko. There are many people that wanted to be here this morning with us, and I would like to acknowledge persons who have asked that we state that they would have wanted to be here but couldn't make it. And included in that list is Dr. Mark Orkin, uh, Dr. Olive Shoshana, and also Dr. Professor Patrick Bond from the Center for Civil Society. And they have suggested that they would like to know what the, the discussions and the conversation transpired here this morning. And of course, this would not be possible without the work and presence of Professor Mohoba. Today's seminar forms part of the public lecture series focusing on issues of transformation, which the College of Humanities started last year. These lectures are on Thursday evenings, and it has been very well attended by UKZN staff and students, and equally important by the, by the public, which includes many of our alumni. But today's seminar is co-hosted by the Council of Higher Education and Transformation, a CHET, and most of us who know CHET would know Dr. Nico Kluter, and if you don't know Dr. Nico Kluter, you probably haven't been around in higher education for a very, very long time. Uh, both Nico and I are psychologists by training, and we refer to our ourselves as the group of failed psychologists who are leaders in higher education. Now, Nico is not the easiest person to work with, I am told. I don't find him that difficult to work with, but anyhow, the two failed psychologists, we worked very hard behind the scenes with my team and with the support of people in this room today to make this event happening to happen. The seminar is organized around various periods in Professor Mohoba's professional life and the persons who are part of the various panel conversations, as you will see, all worked with him during particular periods at various institutions. The, today's seminar was conceptualized with talking to Nico and some other persons, and we decided that it would be an academic, scholarly engagement, but we, we engage with Professor Mahoba, but at another level, it would also be a celebration of his contribution to transformation. The seminar is to reflect, as I've said, on his contribution to transformation, and as we know, an individual's contribution is shaped by his or her ideology and the context, the society which they are part of. In recent months, and in fact, in the past few weeks, there has been an increase of various newspaper articles talking to the lack of transformation at universities, and it's not new. Unfortunately, in my opinion, many of the articles focus on only on issues of numbers and race, and sometimes gender, which are no doubt important issues in the project of transformation, however, 20 years into democracy, one has a feeling of deja vu. We know at some level what the problems are, but we need solutions. On Monday and Tuesday, we were 
part of a HESA seminar series, a two-day seminar, looking at transformation in African languages and mathematics. And I think it was a very, very good idea to link the two. Professor um, Vital gave the, the, the keynote on the second day, and I'm not going to assume what she's going to say here today, but the input that she gave, I thought that it helped move the discussion forward. The keynote speaker on the first day, uh, Professor Derek Swartz, was asked by people in the, in the room, what are the answers or the solutions to, to the issues of transformation in higher education? And interestingly, people in the room wanted simple answers, and we know that there's no simple answers. I'm not sure how many of you have read the Makoko, the, Ma the Makoba Affair? I have read it many times. You'd notice that my one, my copy is yellow. It's very, very yellow. Now, I bought this book in 1997, maybe early 1998, when I was writing my PhD. And it helped me at that point in time understand issues of race in higher education. But at, I, at that stage, was a lecturer or senior lecturer at UWC. And obviously, my positionality and my location at that point in time was different. And the way I understood the issues were also very different. It also helped me through my, a very difficult time at the University of Pretoria, because many of the actors and some of the actresses in this Makoka affair found a home in early 2000s at the University of Pretoria, which I joined as an associate professor in July 2000. In terms of scholarship and transformation, I personally, in the last few weeks and in planning the seminar, have also revisited some of my early work in the early 2000s uh, looking at transformation in higher education. And I looked at the monograph that I did, which was published by, by Chet, Black Academics on the Move, and another article that I wrote on a black woman's experiences at white universities. And the work, I think the obstacles that were identified are correct, both personal and structural, that institutions and individuals at those institutions are engaging and struggling with. But the shortcoming of that work is not focusing on the knowledge project and, the, and visionary leadership as crucial factors to change the landscape. And in the Makoko affair, Professor Mahoba talks to internationalization, good governance, innovation, visionary leadership versus administrators who lead, good governance. And these are concepts and projects which has only entered the policy and implementation strategy of higher education, I think, long after the book was published, which was published in 1997, 1998. And I think some of us in higher education at at, at this point in time, often forget that those are the issues that one needs to look for when we are doing transformation. Transformation is done through excellence. And for me, it's the issue of the knowledge project that is going to drive transformation. But I am only supposed to make very brief opening remarks, and I'm not a panelist. But this morning, as we start our deliberations, where we get to know a bit more about Professor Makhoba's thinkings as a scholar and a leader, but I also believe we will get to know him a bit more about the person. Very often when people ask me, or especially when I joined UKZN a few years ago, they ask me, how is it to work with Professor Makhoba? And it's almost like they want an answer that I don't have. It's a pre-written script. Um, and I see uh, Mr. Trouble over here, Dr. Nico Kluter, title is From Trouble to Transformation, so I also think that the title gives you some insight into the critical discourse that will happen around here this morning. But as we start today, I am reminded of a sentence or a paragraph from the book which for me has relevance in our discussions today, and I quote, through higher education, nations of the world achieve the impossible through seeing the invisible. And I hope 
that this simple statement will underpin our conversation here at UKZNN this morning. I thank you, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Nico Kluter. Nico always has slides, he always has data, and I, I have no doubt that he is going to live up to his reputation in more ways than one. Uh, Nico, thank you for co-hosting this with UKZN. Good morning, everybody. I, William and I actually started off uh, planning a, d a grand debate about transformation between the two of us. Uh, but then we decided, no, there needs to be some other people involved, or William decided. So uh, now we've got a much bigger audience and a much bigger discussion. I'm going to uh, do a, a brief introduction on the issue of transformation. After all, that's what my center is called, except we've changed the name. We got so fed up with the over idealization of transformation that we've actually dropped the word. Uh, remember there was a famous thing where Manuel Castells, when he left South Africa, said uh, it's a word that South Africans use when they stop thinking and they start making social conversation. So we are still trying to think about it, but uh, we thought it doesn't help that much. But I have to, uh, I'll end off by introducing William to, uh, to the bits phase where where we met 19, long, long time ago. And I'll tell you about our first meeting. But before that, uh, William has been become associated and in the newspapers and lots of things around the issue of equity. But actually, William has played, an, um, in my view, an equally, if not more important role in the debate on development. Now, the, the basic debate was set up by Volpe and Badat uh, before we started the National Commission, that there's a tension between equity and development. Equity debate focused on access, change of institutions, curriculum, those issues. But ba basically it was an access issue. Higher education as mobility for the disadvantaged. Versus development, which is uh, the, the other side, science, uh, uh, development issues, applying knowledge, producing new knowledge, uh, more research, more PhDs, that kind of thing. And that always stayed there. That, that tension is still there today. But, and it has shifted. The National Commission was besotted with uh, equity and democratization. But the National Planning Commission, the National Development Report, has shifted the debate significantly towards development. But the issue is always, how do you hold the two together? I put this one also in quote in there because I thought it was uh, very funny. Uh, I found it somewhere. And I thought, uh, the, the second part of the comment is not, uh, is actually you can, you can uh, there is a problem about how the historically black universities were set up in a decontextualized situation. But the first one is really funny, that they, these organic white institutions, uh, uh, I mean, only Charles could have believed that, I think. Uh, but. The big issue, how do you resolve the equity development tension, was clear to us in 1994, because Peter Scott's book had just come out, Massification. You've got to massify the higher education system and differentiate it. You can't massify it without, if you don't differentiate it, then you just have a low level equal for everybody. E equal misery, actually. Uh, but the National Commission rejected they didn't want to talk about differentiation. There were three historically black universities principals in this commission, and they were not going to open this discussion. Redress. They wanted institutional redress. So it was pushed off the agenda. Then massification, when it came to the Department of, of Education, and uh, with my friends uh, Donaldson and Gordon in the Treasury, they said, we're not going to become like the African universities. Uh, ma they massified. The African University didn't massify, they overcrowded the elite systems. They put a lot of students in, in institutions that wasn't designed for them. So they went for planned growth. And look where that took us. The first morning, Jairam Reddy in the National Commission said, the main problem with higher education, and we thought he was going to say, is equity. He said, no, it's the inverted pyramid. South Africa has an inverted pyramid. 
where if you look at the most successful higher education system in the world, probably the US, the pyramid has to be the other way around. The top, you know, there's a small group of, of, of universities, and then it spans out into colleges, community colleges, uh, a much bigger base. The college debate was also ruled out of the National Commission because it was so dominated by university people. Then in the department, Shabani Manganye, uh, my psychologist, another phone psychologist who became very famous and a leader, he said, and remember he got his PhD at Princeton, uh, he said, oh, yeah, he said uh, blacks will not go to community colleges in South Africa. That's second-rate education. We will, they will have proper education. The problem is, of course, we couldn't give them proper education for everybody. So the department was organized so that uh, they didn't, uh, that there wasn't a sec, sec a division in the department that looked at uh, the issue of uh, colleges. So somewhere in 2008 or 9, old Charles Shepard and I, after the day's meeting, sit and having a few drinks, and we say, uh, what happens to these kids that leave school and doesn't get into university? He said, no, nobody knows. So we went to Stat South Africa. And that's when we discovered the needs, the not in education, employment, and training. 2.7 million of them. These are people who've left school, who's not in a university, and who's somewhere out in the system. The department got a huge shock about that. They created a new division. And as you can see, that we have been successful. In, we are beginning to shift. So the shift has taken place towards uh, the colleges. At the same time, there is a, there is a shift towards uh, differentiation, at least in principle, uh, and in some of the funding, although it's not official policy yet. So the transformation debate for me, where we went in chat, was onto this. The other transformation debate became very much a petty bourgeois. It actually, higher education reflected what was going on in business. Black economic empowerment. Small group of blacks fighting to get into WITS and UCT and Natal. That was totally legitimate. But that was only a very, in the big picture of South Africa's economic development and where we're going, that was only one part of the transformation debate. The other part of the transformation debate got submerged. But it, it has come up again in the, in the uh, as I said, in the National Development Plan. Just a quick, this shows you, before we started our Irana study, we looked at uh, South Korea, Finland, and, 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 and the US. This shows you massification. Those countries have all got 90, 80 to 90 percent participation in higher education. And they're also the top, uh, in the top competitive group in the world. And our African countries with our 5, 6, 7 percent participation are all in what's called factory economies, agriculture and mining, digging stuff out of the ground. Uh, so we made a huge mistake when we did not go for massification and expanding higher education as a system. But it also had an interesting effect on what happened in the universities. The, the actual participation rate for, for blacks actually went up very little. For whites, it hasn't changed. The, you know, if you look in the university, you see all these black kids and black staff, and you think, ah, the universities have become black. They have. But if you look at the big picture, then the participation rates haven't changed. Well, the whites have stayed the same because so many of them have left the country, so, uh, and their birth rates are down. So the proportion, but the proportion that goes to university is still the same that it was uh, in 1994. And in a small, because this is an elite university system, in international terms, it's under 20% participation. In an elite system, if all the students in the system are black, the participation rate would only be 20%. So it means we would still have an elite system with a very low participation rate for black people and for African people. So that's part of the transformation debate that we're busy with now. This is the, then comes the National Planning Commission where William has now shifted. On the one hand, he's developing this controversial, if I can use the word, one equity index. Uh, on the other hand, and this, this to me sums up William. On the other hand, he's busy with, in the National Planning Commission with a, with a different agenda. 
with an agenda that all, he said to me one day, if, if an academic doesn't have a PhD, they shouldn't be an academic. You don't have a doctor with a half a qualification, you're either a doctor or you're not a doctor. And globally now, the issue is to increase PhDs, both not for academia, but also for business in the international talent competition. This is, they're looking for people with PhDs in business. In Germany now, only 5% of the PhDs consider going into university. The others are all looking for jobs elsewhere. But the main thing is to improve the quality of higher education. You've got to improve the percentage of people with PhDs. And Williams University is uh, working on it, uh, but if you compare them to some of the other universities, they're not doing that well yet. But put in place to increase research output, to increase uh, PhD production, we did a correlation of all academics, and, and the correlation between publishing and having a PhD is comma eight two, uh, which means the people who publish without a PhD is an exception. Uh, like the, so if you want to lift the quality and the research output and the knowledge production of your institution, you've got to change the composition of your staff, which is something that William has been on. Just two quick little things to show that uh, do doctoral graduates produced by universities in 2012, the Tel UKZN is not doing too badly, quite close to the top. In, uh, in terms of uh, proportion of black doctoral graduates, they actually behind two traditionally, historically black universities who don't really have white students. So in, in that case, they're doing uh, very well. And then also uh, in terms of uh, women, the percentage of, of graduates who are women is, is uh, second highest in the country. Now, I hope I've, I've shown these two sides of the debate and, uh, and I, hope that we can have the debate not just on the one side, uh, uh, on, on the equity side, but I'm going to conclude by William at Wits, coming into Wits. Two, two, two short comments. I went to the 11th floor, where the top floor of Wits, which was built by the dean, designed by the dean of architecture at Wits. That 11th floor had these lovely carpets. It didn't have a toilet for women because the, 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 the dean never thought there was gonna be a woman vice chancellor or a woman deputy vice chancellor and the secretaries had to go one, one, one floor down. Uh, into this, I walk in there one morning, we've been hearing this rumor of this black guy coming, the smart black academic is coming. But of course the staff was never consulted. We weren't part of selection or anything. We just heard rumors. There in walks, I walk in there, out of the office comes this black man. You must remember he walked into the Senate looking like an Arab, dressed in flowing gowns, etc. But he comes out of his office in the jeans and t-shirts and barefoot. Now the three top other guys all went to, uh, what's that fancy school, Eddie? St. John's. St. John's. They went to the same school. They were wearing blue jackets, gray flannels, and a witz tie every day. And I looked at this and I said, yeah. So I go and I phone my friend Derek Young. And I said, Derek, I've seen him. But he... <laughs> Uh, there's, there's a black man on the 11th floor. Eddie said yesterday, the only blacks that you saw at the Bits 11th floor were cleaning uh, for, for a century. I said, but there's a problem, you know, he's wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Do you think this is transformation? There's a long silence and Derek says, no, I think it's trouble. Uh, <laughs> and that, well, when this troublesome chap left, or before he left, the famous other psychologist, failed psychologist Shabani Mangania gave a speech uh, departing from Wits. And he said a very important and interesting thing to us. He said, Wits hasn't started the transformation process because Wits is like an alcoholic. An alcoholic has to admit that there's a problem before it can start changing. And up to this time, Wits hadn't acknowledged that they had. But by the time that William Mahova left Wits, and every one of the gang of 13 was on their way to leaving the university. Wits knew they had a problem. They didn't quite know how to solve it, but at least they knew they had a problem. Thank you. I've told Nico that uh, academic freedom is really going to be part and parcel of today, but where I'm going to put the 
the, the key is, is these stories. Uh, there's many, if you know Nico, you know many of them, but thanks very much, Nico. I would also just like to acknowledge people that have uh, come into the room a bit late. Uh, I see Professor Sipo Sipe. I also see members or people that were past presidents of the SRC. So thank you for being here. We're going to move into the next session, and we set this um, seminar up as a, in a way, uh, that's a conversation. Uh, from the way we've set up the, the tables over here to the way that we will engage with panelists. I would like to ask Professor Eddie Webster, or Eddie, Edward Webster, to come to, to, the, to, the, to the, uh, the table in the front, as well as Dr. Russell Arley. I am not going to introduce the panelists to you. you they, they, um, their CVs and their bio is in the the book that you have in the program, all but to say, I, I think most of you know Professor Webster, who he is and his work. He's currently and for a long time based at WITS, and uh, Dr. Russell Arley was also at WITS, and he is currently at the University on the Hill, UCT. I also just want to, I decide Nico would give the input when I've told you he has all these statistics, him and his friend Johan Maton. And um, when this morning I also got another question, how is UKZN doing in terms of research? And we have increased our research output, we've increased our number of doctoral graduates, both staff and students, we're getting there. But the answer to the question is, how are we doing in terms of research, in terms of research output measured by the Department of Higher and Education and Training, UKZN is for the second year the top university in the country. So for the second year running, I, I, I've been saying this like a brand manager for two years, we are the best no matter how much you want to criticize it in whatever way you look at it, but in terms of DOE statistics, we are ahead of all 23, maybe I should say 25, counting the two new universities as the top research-led university in the, in the country. And I believe that we've got there through driving the knowledge project, through scholarship and pr uh, production of, of knowledge. Um, we are going to ask the panelists to, to speak to us and share with us the experiences that they've had with Professor Malahapuru uh, Mahoba. You've noticed that Nico calls him uh, w William, people in my family that were maybe with you at med school, Professor Mahoba, always ask me, how's Willie? And then I have to think, who are you talking about? So it is Professor Malakapuru Mahoba, and I'm wondering, Professor Mahoba, maybe you're wanting to come to the front and sit with your fellow Vitsis over here, like they call them, or call themselves, and uh, they would give input, and then you would respond. Thanks very much. Right, um, thank you uh, for those words of uh, introduction and Professor Potkita, Professor Mahoba, Professor van Jarsveld, uh, colleagues, friends, comrades. <laughs> 